Hello, I greet you, and I greet you in the presence of the Most Holy Trinity, of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Giovanni Bosco was making great progress in his studies of Italian grammar and Latin with Don Calosso. However, when Don Calosso passed away, Giovanni's learning abruptly came to a halt. As a result, Mamma Margherita decided to enroll him in the government school of Castelnuovo. Unfortunately, by the time they sought admission, the school had already started on. It started on November the 1st, making it challenging for Giovanni to be accepted. Margarita had a brother named Michele, who was a well-known figure in Castelnuovo, and this connection proved crucial in overcoming the challenge. As a matter of fact, Michele succeeded in enrolling Giovanni just the same in the school of Castelnuovo around Christmas of the year 1830, when Giovanni was already 15 years old. Although it was an elementary school, they had also begun offering a Latin language course. Giovanni's mother made every effort to ensure her son could continue his education, aspiring for him to one day become a priest. Let's put it bluntly, Giovanni felt a bit confused. Previously, he received private lessons from Don Calosso, but now he attends a public school where he learns alongside other children. Not only that, but the distance from Becky's house to Castelnuovo school was quite long. Giovanni had to make the journey twice a day, in the morning, coming back at noon, and in the afternoon, coming back at 4, 4 p.m. The, long, the total distance he covered back and forth was, not a joke, was 20 kilometers on foot. The road was far from smooth and he had to endure this daily. However, Mama Margarita had a different perspective. She advised him to make the trip only once, which would give him more time to study. By eliminating the extra walking time, he could utilize it for his studies instead. In the winter, it was incredibly challenging for Giovanni to walk such a long distance. He faced rain, hail, strong winds, and the ground was often covered in mud. However, Giovanni endured all, all these sufferings out of love for Jesus remaining composed and serene. To prevent his mother from spending extra money on him, especially when the streets were muddy, he would take off his shoe and carry them in his hand. As a result, he would arrive in Castelnuovo with freezing cold, muddy feet, and sometimes they would even be blooded. When he arrived at Castelnuovo, he would slip on his shoes and visit Giovanni Roberto, who was a trustworthy man, who would welcome him between his lessons. On days of heavy rain, he would forego visiting his mother's house in Becchi and instead spend the night at Giovanni Roberto's place where a bed was made ready for him under the stairs. Mama Margherita had told him to make that walk every day from Becchi to Castelnuovo, where the school was, to save money. But when she saw how bad the winter was, she thought it would be better to find a place for him in Castelnuovo itself, where he could stay every day. That way he would cut down a lot on, of, on walking and have much more time for studying. 
the payment of the lodging could be made not only with money, but also through the giving of cereals, wine, vegetables or fruit. Always according to the agreement. Giovanni Bosco was very much loved in Becchi. Neighbors saw that Margarita was going to suffer a lot to make all that payment so that her son Giovanni could learn at the school of Castelnuovo. Therefore, they would sometimes make a collection of vegetables, fruits, cereals and wine and would give them gladly to Margarita. That is how Margarita managed to handle the substantial expenses required for her son's education. Upon realizing how much Giovanni Roberto cared for her son, she made the decision for Giovanni to stay with him day and night, agreeing to a payment arrangement they both agreed upon. Giovanni Roberto, a tailor and a fervent music lover, particularly of Gregorian chant, was involved. Thus, one day, Margherita, accompanied by her son Giovanni, went and discussed the payment terms with Giovanni Roberto. Before parting away from her son, she imparted these words to him. Giovanni, always remain devoted to Our Lady. When the people of Castelnuovo discovered that Giovanni Bosco was staying in their village, they were all amazed, filled with curiosity to catch a glimpse of him. Merely his presence had the power to enchant them. The younger children of the Caliero family would often gather by the door each morning, eagerly awaiting Giovanni Bosco's passing. He would stroll by, books tugged under his arm, either alone or occasionally accompanied by his friends from the same school of Castelnuovo. He would be clad in an old jacket that didn't quite suit him. At school, there were children from affluent families who had a superiority complex, believing that they alone were important, while the other children from various parts of Castelnuovo, such as Becchi, were considered insignificant. Therefore, when they saw Giovanni Bosco in that miserable clothing, they sat and laughed at him. Occasionally, one of them would sneak up behind him on tiptoes and tuck a Giovanni's jacket before swiftly retreating. Some would comment, the parish priest must have given him the jacket, while others would speculate, that's his grandfather's jacket. Giovanni listened, listened patiently never becoming angry or losing his temper. At times, he would face them and say with a smile, you mischievous rascals, sit still for a while and leave me alone. I am not bothering any of you. But since Giovanni was kind to them and started also gathering again children and to entertain them with his gymnastics and acrobatics, Little by little, he attracted all the children to himself, even those who used to say offensive words to him. What we read in the book of Syrac in the Old Testament applies here. A sweet word makes many friends. A sweet word makes many friends. In those times, all the schools had a distinctly Catholic character in accordance with the orders issued by King Carlo Felice on the 23rd of July, 1822, 1822. The schools were not allowed to be co-educational, boys and girls to be educated together, but separately. 
It was mandatory for a crucifix to be displayed on a wall in every classroom. The school day would begin with a prayer during the first lesson and conclude with a thanksgiving prayer during the last lesson. The initial half hour of instruction was dedicated to catechism. The teachers aimed to coordinate with the local parish priest to arrange a mass before school commenced and children also had the opportunity to receive the sacrament of confession once a month. On religious days of obligation, all the children were required to participate in catechism and attend parish church celebrations. Giovanni Bosco used to wholeheartedly participate in these religious celebrations, all the while making remarkable strides in his studies. He excelled to such an extent that his teacher was deeply drawn to him and held great admiration for him. On one occasion, the teacher assigned the class an Italian composition for Homer, and the chosen topic was the story of Elazar, as described in the second book of the Maccabees in the Old Testament, chapter 6. Eleazar, who chose death over causing offense by consuming pork. Giovanni was able to recount the story in its entirety, but no one wanted to believe that he had written it himself. His writing circulated among various teachers, each of whom was astounded by the ingenious manner in which Giovanni Bosco crafted the narrative. Eventually, the story reached his teacher, Don Molia. Upon reading Giovanni's work, he promptly declared that even the most elderly and wise individuals in the vicinity would struggle to produce a composition of such caliber. Therefore, he concluded that the composition could not possibly have been written by the young Giovanni Bosco. Consequently, his teacher, Don Molia, started viewing Giovanni Bosco in a negative light and grew so displeased that he eventually told him that he was incapable of studying. As a result, Don Molia suggested to Giovanni Bosco to leave school and engage in manual labor instead, such as hoeing. The Lord God allowed this attitude of teacher Don Molia to resurface as he desired Giovanni Bosco to place his trust solely in him. Despite being far from his mother Margarita, Giovanni still carried a profound love for her. I mention this because there is a saying, out of sight, out of mind. That's what we say, out of sight, out of mind. The valuable lessons she imparted to him through her words and actions remained in his heart throughout his entire life. He wouldn't take any action without her permission, and she provided him with everything he required. Roberto and his family grew to love Giovanni Bosco dearly. He used to attend school with their son, and the two children formed a strong bond of friendship. Every week, Mama Margarita would bring Giovanni a week's supply of bread, ensuring he had enough to sustain him. Despite the long distance she had to travel, Margarita felt the need to stay updated on her son's well-being. Even when Giovanni Bosco moved to Chieri later on to further his studies and prepare for the priesthood, Margherita continued to visit him occasionally. Giuseppe, Giovanni's Bosco brother and Margherita's son, often accompanied her on these visits. 
I mention this because Antonio, Giovanni Boscov's half-brother, was not Margherita's son, but was born to another mother. Giovanni Roberto's family used to rejoice greatly when Margherita would come to visit them, owing to her big and generous heart. Mamma Margherita would be delighted to hear Roberto's family speak about how much Giovanni wanted to follow her advice, how virtuously he lived his life, how fervently he prayed, and how dedicated he was to his studies and work. They would also mention how well regarded he was among his schoolmates, his deep, his, his deep devotion to Jesus and Our Lady, his humility in both words and actions, his regular participation in the sacraments of confession and communion, his respectful behavior in church, and his frequent attendance at church events. Because of all these qualities, the parish priest, Don D'Assano, appointed Giovanni Bosco as his assistant in the catechism class. However, that didn't mean that there was no one who envied him or tried to lead him into sin, attempting to make him abandon the church and the sacraments. Giovanni Bosco always remained steadfast in his virtuous life. It was in the first time that some friends had urged him to skip school and join them in play. Giovanni would offer the excuse that he couldn't afford to go along with them. They would suggest that he should steal some people, even their own parents. One of their friends once said to him, Dear Giovanni, it's time for you to grow and take charge of your life. You need to learn how to survive in the real world. If you keep your eyes closed, you won't see where you are going. Consider how to make money and enjoy it with your friends. Having heard these words, Giovanni Bosco said to him, I cannot understand what you are trying to tell me, but it sounds like you are asking me to skip school, to play truant, and steal. In our Catechism lessons, we learn about the seventh commandment, do not steal. This is God's commandment, and those who steal are considered thieves. Thieves have a bad ending. My mother loves me a lot. She loves me dearly. And if I need money for something good, she gives it to me. I don't do anything without her permission, and I have no intention of starting now to disobey her. If your friends are engaging in the actions you want me to do, then they are bad kids. And if, if, and if they are encouraging others to do the same, they are brats. Giovanni's words spread from one friend to another and no one dared to tell him to play through and again, or engage in appropriate behavior. His words also reached the ears of his teacher, who, as a result, started to love him even more. <clears throat> the parents of children who heard Giovanni's words and began to admire him encouraged their children to stay with Giovanni, to imitate him in his life. That's how Giovanni Bosco could choose his friends more wisely, selecting those who wanted to live like him. Just like the children from Morialdo and Moncucco, who used to come to Castel Uovo to see him and chat with him there. Because of his good friends, Giovanni used to evaluate himself frequently. He would ensure that he didn't utter a word that could cause any scandal among them. He made sure to be cautious in everything he did and advised them to do. He was extremely careful and would carefully consider his words 
before speaking. As a result, gradually, his friends started emulating his behavior. Whenever he visited his mother's house in Becky during the holidays, he would bring some fruits from there and distribute them among his friends. This is how their friendship continued to flourish. Giovanni Bosco used to seize various opportunities to discuss religion and devotion to the Virgin Mary with his friends. He had a fondness for visiting a specific church known as the Church of the Castle, situated on a hill. He enjoyed going there, both alone and sometimes accompanied by his friends, in order to pray before the image of Our Lady present in the church. The memory of his visits to worship Our Lady of the Castle always stayed with him. By the time Giovanni Filippello would visit him in Turin later on, when Giovanni Bosco had already become a priest and was recognized as Don Bosco, on such occasions he would give Filippello a packet of holy pictures of Our Lady to distribute among the people who ascended the hill, entered the castle church and engaged in the prayer of the rosary to honor Mary. Both the priests and the people held one opinion about Giovanni Bosco. He was incredibly good and served as an excellent role model whenever and wherever he went. They regarded him as a young apostle. Moreover, the mothers viewed him as an exemplary child and would frequently speak to their own children about Giovanni Bosco. This admiration and influence were evident in Morialdo, then in Moncucco, and now in Castelnuovo. Monsignor Caliero, a Salesian himself, who led the first Salesian missionaries in Patagonia, and later he became a bishop and a cardinal. Therefore, Monsignor Caliero delighted in recounting how his mother would often encourage him to emulate Giovanni Bosco during his childhood. Giovanni Bosco was striving. Despite being only 15 years old, he spent the days engaging in good deeds, studying and enjoying the company of his friends. However, amidst the happiness that filled his life and his heart, he had a constant source of pain. What was this source? It was the fact that none of the parish priests in Castelnuovo were friends with Giovanni Bosco, despite his aspiration to become a priest. The parish priest, Don Bartolomeo D'Assano, was a wise and charitable man who carried out his duties diligently, but he regarded children and young people with disdain. The other priests shared the same sentiment. Since that time, Giovanni Bosco had felt a strong desire to love children deeply and to establish familiarity with them. However, during that period, parish priests and priests used to conduct themselves in this manner. Yet, Giovanni began to realize that such an approach instilled fear in children and young people rather than love. Occasionally, he would even shed tears over this issue and express, if I were a priest, I would behave differently. I would personally approach children and young people, engage in conversation with them, express my love for them, offer kind words, provide valuable advice, and even sacrifice my life for them. I would do everything in my power to save their souls. How joyful I would be if I could have a conversation with a priest. I experienced this joy when Don Calosso was still alive. Why can't I have the same with the other priests? He would also share these feelings with his mother, Margarita, who knew her son well. She would say to him, and what do you want to do then? 
the priests are wise individuals full of serious thoughts and they don't know how to adapt and communicate with a child like you? Giovanni would respond, but what will they lose if they say something to me, if they spend just a minute with me? Margarita would ask him, and what do you want them to tell you? To this Giovanni would answer, they can share some good thoughts that can benefit my soul. Margarita used to tell him, look at how much they have to do in the confessional, in the pulpit, and with all the other work of the parish. Giovanni would counter, aren't we children also part of their flock? Margarita would concede, yes, that's true, but they don't have time to spare. Giovanni would reply, so did Jesus waste time when he was with children? when he reprimanded the apostles who wanted to send the children away. He told them to let the children come to him because the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Mar Margarita would tell him, I don't blame you. On the contrary, you are right in what you are telling me. But what can you do? And here Giovanni Bosco would say to her, as for me, well, you will see, if I become a priest, I will dedicate my entire life to children and young people. They will never see me with a serious or unpleasant expression. Instead, I will always be the one who reaches out to them first. Thank you for listening. You who are listening and me, one day in heaven, together shall be, always by the power of God's grace. Give importance to God's grace, because grace is a great power, and we can win all temptations, easily, always, immediately, by God's grace. So ask God to give you this grace, this great power. And consequently, you will love him more.